Welcome back, everyone, to the Geomicrobiology UK seminar series. This is our second to last seminar in the year, and I'm really excited today uh, to, um, to have our speaker, Christina Cato, Dr. Cato from the University of Milan with us. Um, just to give you a, a brief introduction to, to her and her work, she is currently a, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Milan. She received her um, PhD in chemistry, biochemistry, and the ecology of pesticides and then was a visiting research scholar for a while at the Center for um, Biofilm Engineering at Montana State University in Bozeman, where she specialized in biofilm ecology. She, I met Christina actually when she was visiting the University of Melbourne as an Endeavor Fellow, which is a really prestigious and competitive uh, postdoctoral research program, and as well as doctoral research program uh, sponsored by the Australian government. And while she was there, I had the pleasure of meeting her and, and learning about her research that was combining uh, microbiology and mineralogy and the built environment, um, looking at, at the microbiology of building stones is really fascinating stuff. And she's gonna talk to us about some of that today, about the ecology of biofilms in the built environment. Um, she's been quite a productive researcher thus far, I think authoring 22 articles in peer reviewed international journals um, with uh, uh, moderate to high impact factors. And, and I think it's just bespoke of, of or it speaks well of, of her work and productivity in this exciting interdisciplinary area of geomicrobiology and environmental microbiology already. So I'm really pleased to welcome her to the series today. And um, please uh, note that we will be recording. So if you'd like to turn your mics off, that would be great. And um, feel free to, to throw any questions into the chat as we go along. We'll try to make sure we pick them up at the end. Um, but of course, you, you're always welcome to, uh, to turn your cameras on at the end and introduce yourself to, to Christina and or others in the room and, and ask your question in person. Okay, so I, I think that's probably it for me. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up and turn it over to Christina. Thanks very much for joining us today, Christina. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you very much, Professor Moreau, for inviting me to this uh, seminar. And let me introduce, I am Cristina Cato, I am currently a postdoc at the University of Milan, one of the largest institutions in Italy. I am currently joined the Environmental Microbiology Lab at the Department of Food, Environmental and Nutritional Sciences under the supervision of Professor Francesca Capitelli and Federica Villa, two major experts in the field of environmental microbiology and cultural heritage conservation. Here you can find my contact details and the lab website. Um, today I will speak about microorganisms in habiting stone materials with regards to their negative and positive effects uh, for the stone. Um, the, use of, the use of stone as a medium for artistic expression has ranged from the construction of ancient monuments and historic buildings to small scale sculpture and contemporary buildings. In natural environments, the transformation of stone into sand and soil is a natural recycling process essential to the life on Earth. However, when a rock is used as building material, the decays are clearly seen as a negative or destructive process. What is becoming clear is that many factors affect the durability of stone, physical, chemical, biological agents, acting co-association to deteriorate stone. Among these are wind, sunlight, temperature, as well as rain, snow, moisture, and even air pollution. This agent will induce both physical and chemical weathering processes. The first affects the stability of the rough matrix, while the second has through chemical corrosion of the stone forming minerals. However, a considerable number of investigations have assessed the essential role that biological agents play in deterioration of stone, both in natural environment as well as, well as in building and monuments. It is not surprising to observe microorganisms on the rocks. Microorganisms can be observed on all kinds of stone monuments, such as castles, caves, churches, temples, and can be associated with problems of conservation. Rocks are oligotrophic environment. However, mineral surfaces represent one of the main sources of micronutrients accessible to the biosphere. And the number of microorganisms in this dry terrestrial environment is similar to the total number of microorganisms in rich nutrient habitats. 
Biodeterioration was defined as undesirable changes in the properties of a material caused by the vital activities of organisms. Bacteria, archaea, fungi, lichens, as well as insects, are constantly causing problems in the conservation of some cultural heritage. The history of biodeterioration of art is long, and cases of red and green leprosy in houses can be described even in the Bible. However, it is important has been neglected for a long time, as chemical and physical processes were believed to be the dominant factors of material decay. In recent decades, however, the dogma has changed, and it is now generally agreed that fungi and bacteria inhabit and penetrate into the soil material, resulting in material loss. I would like to highlight to you that biodeterioration is not limited to soil material, but it is true for all type of historic artifacts. Microorganisms are able to colonize every kind of surfaces, ranging from biotic to abiotic one, textile, paper, wood, and even art made of modern materials such as synthetic polymers in public museum, in, art, in private art collection, or provide substrate for microbial growth. Microbes Hitting a Weird Piece of History is a title of an article on the New York Times of some years ago that indicates the importance of microbes in the conservation of cultural heritage. Biodeterioration of stones involves a combination of physical and chemical damages together with aesthetic alteration of cultural heritage materials. Chemical process take place indirectly through the chemical release of metabolic products or directly by the microbial enzymatic activity. The biogenic release of corrosive acids is probably the best known and most commonly investigated chemical mechanism. The process is known as biocorrosion and is caused by the microbial secretion of inorganic and organic acids. Biocorrosion results in local pitting. Pitting is um, hard, distinct blind holes, generally of cylindrical shape, uh, and death in stone. Biopitting occurs uh, predominantly on marble and limestone. And you can see biopitting in this picture. Biocorrosion processes also include alkaline reaction, contributing to solubilize the stone, and ex ex um, exudation of organic Latin agents, which sequester metallic cation from stone. Um, physical decay is the mechanical damage of the stone leading to the alteration of the, the material structure, including the loss of cohesion in the substrate. The mechanical pressure during microorganism growth can lead to the alteration of the stone's pore size and result in change of moisture circulation and pattern and temperature response. In the picture, I show marble and limestone surfaces colonized by black meristematic fungi. On the bottom, marble cross section show the penetration into the substrate along the intercrystalline spaces. Uh, finally, uh, the aesthetic alteration of the stone is due by uh, the biogenic pigments of bacteria and fungi. The coloration of stone surfaces can change the stone thermal aggregate properties. Biogenic pigments responsible for the discoloration of stone can be black stain, as in the case of melanin, green and greenish stains um, in the case of photosynthetic pigments, yellow, orange, brownish stain in the case of carotenoids and degradation products of chlorophyll, and bright orange or pink or red stain from pigments of chemiorganotrophic bacteria. Uh, however, it is important to stress that biodeterioration process on a given site, both natural and built, are rarely, close, are rarely caused by one distinct group of microorganisms. Biodeterioration is the result of the interaction of complex mixed self-sustaining microbial communities. This mode of life is called biofilm, and it represents the dominant mode of microbial life in many natural and artificial ecosystems. The biofilm lifestyle is exactly the opposite of the plantoni lifestyle. In the plantoni lifestyle cells, life flowing in a rich medium inside a flask, but this is not uh, a microbial life uh, of the real world. This is just a laboratory condition that does not reflect the real microbial life, except that acute infection in humans. Biofilm consists of dense cluster 
of microbial cells immobilized on the surface and embed in a cell produced organic polymeric matrix. The matrix consists of polysaccharide, proteins, lipids, fatty acid, and even extracellular DNA. The matrix holds the cell aggregates together and to the substratum. The matrix can be considered as the house of the biofilm cells, in which cells can organize their, li their life. As regarding soil surfaces, biofilm occur on contact surface at the interface between the mineral substratum and the atmosphere. Therefore, these biofilms are called subaerial biofilms. On the soil, microorganisms are constantly subjected to adverse environmental conditions, such as intense solar radiation, desiccation, temperature, and lack of nutrients. The temperature on rock surfaces ranges at least from minus 45, minus 50 to plus 60. Water availability fluctuates from long period of total desiccation to being covered with film of water that overlay the biofilm completely. Irradiation ranges from low doses of radiation at night to extremely high infrared and ultraviolet radiation during summer days. The biofilm mode of life is the successful strategy of adaptation when surface environmental conditions are adverse from life. So the biofilm matrix protects the stone microflora from extreme temperature, as well as toxic impacts by salt and heavy metal accumulation, and rapid extreme fluctuation in physical condition. The matrix provides the protection from desiccation. The matrix provides the protection from intense radiation, erosion. The matrix increases the recovery of nutrients do the interspecies interaction, as well as by entrapment of airborne particles of organic and inorganic compound, and act as a nutrient storage. Additionally, biofilm favor the interplay among microorganisms and promote social behavior through cooperation and communication, as well as the exchange of genetic material. In the picture on the right is to a confocal as the scanner imaging of a subaerial biofilm growing on the Lincoln Memorial Monument in Washington. In blue, you can see um, uh, macro colonies of phototrophic microbes. In green, chemotrophic microorganisms, and in red, the polymeric matrix. And uh, you can see that phototrophic communities are characterized by cocoid structures assembled in cluster. This is uh, the cocoid structures. Um, Um, the formation of the extracellular polymeric matrix led to the establishment of stable gradients within the biofilm. Um, and these gradients provide different localized habitats at a small scale. In an anaerobic biofilm, organisms are stratified according to oxygen availability, which becomes depleted in the lower layer of the biofilm. In the same way, in an aerobic oligotrophic biofilm, nutrient consumption by organisms in the upper layer result in the starvation of organisms in the lower layers, which may lead to the adoption of slow growth states, such as those found in dormant cells. Other gradients that are present in biofilm include pH gradients, which are produced by heterotrophic metabolism. The result is a pronounced three-dimensional stratification of bacterial community, depending on of gradients. In most of cases, phototrophs dominate closer to the biofilm air interface in contact with the external environment. This is because phototrophs have a distinct advantage over many other organisms. Thanks to their resistance to desiccation and the high level of UV radiation. Therefore, the vertical and lower <clears throat> uh, microorganisms are not directly exposed to physical stresses, thanks to the efficient response of the phototrophic microorganism on the top of the biofilms. Um, biofilm development on stone is a complex process involving different steps. Biofilm formation begins with the addition of pionary macroorganisms to a surface after the stone has been conditioned by adsorption of organic and inorganic molecules. 
Phototrophic microorganisms such as uh, microalgae, cyanobacteria, and lichens are the pioneer organisms in the colonization of soil materials. Cyanobacteria are able to induce or reduce the metabolism as a, fun as a function of the water input. Therefore, they grow is not limited by unfavorable humid conditions and contribute to the wild river zone in humid as well as semi-arid and arid environments. The accumulation of synthetic biomass provided the organic nutrient base for the subsequent heterotropic microflora that are the secondary colonizer. Then the biofilm become a multi-species community and the matter production is further stimulated by cell cell communication. In the final step, pieces of biofilm detach from the surface, providing the active dispersion of microorganisms that colonize new surfaces. Um, the concept of biofilm implies to take into consideration the interaction among microorganisms, the interaction with the substratum and the environment. Subaerial so biofilm do not simply cover the lithic surface, but rather they interact with the storm. The development of a specific biological species on a particular storm surface is determined by the nature and properties of the storm, such as mineral constituents, pH, relative percentage of various minerals, salinity, moisture content, texture but also depend on environmental factors, such as temperature, relative humidity, light condition, the amount and type of airborne microbial contaminants, as well as specific microclimate parameters, including orientation and shedding. Additionally, it depends on the interaction with the other microbial community found in the surrounding soil and air. Uh, therefore, the degree of biological colonization of a stone surface depends not only on environmental factor, but also on the interesting properties of the material. Therefore, two different types of stone may undergo different degree of colonization under the same environmental condition. We say that stone material are different in bioreceptivity. Bioreceptivity is the aptitude of a material to be colonized by one or several group of living organisms without necessarily undergoing any damages. The word colonize is very important since it excludes the ability of a material to receive a living organism in a transient manner. The bioreceptivity of stone is mainly described by the intrinsic structure and chemical composition of stone. Hyporotity stone has a deep penetration of moisture into the material, preparing the way for a microbial contamination to a deep up to five centimeters. Large pore sand stone with a short water retention promote microbial contamination only temporarily. On the contrary, small pore stone with longer water retention time provide more suitable condition for the long settlement of stone colonizing microorganisms. The pictures show different cyanobacterial colonization depending on surface roughness, calcareous rocks, calcareous rock on the left, and mammal in the right. Rugged surfaces are usually colonized more quickly than smooth surfaces since the irregularities in the surface may form anchoring site and macro refuge for the attachment of microbial colonization. And information about the bioreceptivity of stone is of great importance since it helps us to understand the material properties which influence the development of biological colonization and also provide useful information as regards selecting stone for the conservation of heritage monuments and construction of new buildings. Selection of the most appropriate type of stone for use in new building in terms of durability of the material is one of the most important aspects as regards maintaining the quality of out of outdoor stone. The bioreceptivity, the bioreceptivity of a given material can be assessed by artificially inoculating the material with one or few species of microorganisms under optimal environmental condition and quantifying the resulting by microbial, microbial mass. For example, in the picture, the author of the research inoculated different types of stone with a mixed suspension of cyanobacteria and quantified the microbial mass 
after 90 days. Um, a recent work performed in our lab in Milano supported the importance of color as a new factor influencing the surface colonization by cyanobacteria and its contribution to biofilm information. This is based on the idea that light reflected from a surface influence both the intensity and the quality of the light this, that cyanobacteria receive. In this work, hacker plates were prepared by spraying different color on the bottom in the outer side of petri dishes. Color chosen were blue, black, red, and white. Plates were filled with agar medium and subaeal biofilm using cyanobacteria were, grow, were grown by using the colony biofilm techniques. In the colony biofilm techniques, a polycarbonate semi-permeable membrane is placed on the top of the medium and is inoculated with a suspension of cyanobacteria. This setup prevents the biofilm forming organisms um, from coming in direct contact with the paint that could be toxic. The, the biofilm were cultured in a controlled cabinet environment under simulated daylight. And at each time point, the biofilm colonies were removed from the biofilm and analyzed. This, this, uh, this study demonstrated for the first time that the color of a surface affect biofilm formation at the air-solid interface with more biomass accumulated on white um, and red substrate than on blue and black substrate. The growth of biofilm on the white bottoming plates was supported by the highest light intensity followed by the biofilm grow on the red plates, while biofilm on blue and black plates grew the slowest, experiencing the lowest light intensity. Light reaching the biofilm in the four color surface it was different, not only in terms of quantity, but also as quality. Biofilm on white surfaces receive a full spectrum of light, both from the top and reflected from the bottom. Instead, red, blue, and black surfaces reflected only some bands of visible spectrum. Additionally, the biofilm architecture was different depending on the color substrate. Biofilm was thick on white and red um, surface, and biofilm was thin on blue and black surface. Um, to understand the impact of biofilm on stone, a multidisciplinary approach is needed. Integration of molecular technologies with classical cultivation experiment and microscopic characterization of artwork may provide the better understanding of biodegradation. Selection of the appropriate methodology for microbial is usually based on conservation restriction and study purpose. I would like um, to highlight to you that much has been done to study the ecology of microorganisms responsible for biodeterioration. But there are still many not answered questions, and this lack of knowledge inhibits the development of effective and non destructive conservation strategies. Um, imagine a biofilm with convocal laser scan and microscope is uh, an extremely powerful tool in biofilm research, as it is the most powerful technique to study biofilm components, like spatial and temporal pattern of microbial colonization, specific biofilm components, interaction and cellular activities. Sampling is made by adhesive tapes uh, applied on the surface, and gently detach it from the surface. The microscope examination is possible using water immersible lenses that do not require cover slip, with resultant pressure and distortion of the biofilm 3D structure. Proteins, polysaccharide, and DNA can be stained by specific dyes and visualized by the microscope and quantified by dedicated software. Uh, for example, in this very beautiful 3D image of a stone biofilm, we can see the heterotroph microorganisms standing with the cyanotonine in green and the phototroph bacteria in red that are out of flourish. And now I would like to show you this movie. Okay, so you can see in red cyanobacteria and in green heterotrophic microorganisms. 
and this is the um, this is a very a very beautiful uh, three-dimensional picture and in gray you can see the stone here cyanobacteria and heterotrophic bacteria This is a very beautiful picture. Um, okay. Okay. Um, a very interesting technique based on the use of confocal microscope is called time lapse confocal laser scan microscope. This technique uh, allows to evaluate the threshold value up to which biofilm resists on the surface under antimicrobial treatment. And this is sometimes evaluable information. The technique is able to record both the spatial and temporal pattern of biocide action against a biofilm. Sample is uh, collected by using the additive tape technique. The biofilm is stained with the fluorescent dye that labeled viable cell, and the biocide solution is applied on the sample. The loss of fluorescence from senate cell is measured, and it is indicative of the real-time loss in cell viability during the biocide action. And it is also uh, possible to use a specific cell that is, uh, um, that is called flow cell. Here you can see, um, this is the details of the confocal laser scan and microscope. Um, now, I would like to show you um, a work performed by my colleagues Capital and Villa. In this video, it is possible to observe the real-time loss in cell viability over time in the presence of biocide solution treatment. And chemotroph uh, microorganisms being visualized in green by calcine, which detects metabolically active cells. And phototroph have been visualized in red by using the natural autofluorescence of the photosynthetic pigments. Here, uh, the movie uh, about the loss of fluorescence of these microorganisms in the presence of Clorox uh, beach uh, um, uh, solution. No? Okay. So at the end of the experiment, the biofilm was uh, completely uh, black. So the soap was completely black because uh, cell completely lost, lost the fluorescence. Um, it, is, um, it, it is the movie about a 20 minutes experiment. Okay. This is a very beautiful uh, technique. Um, sometimes a good strategy is that to work with a simplified lab-based model system. Uh, a device commonly used to grow biofilm important for cultural heritage is the drip flow reactor. Um, the drip flow reactor consists of four or six parallel test channels. Here, the channel, um, uh, each able of holding one stone sample with the dimension of a microscope slide. Uh, media is provided by dripping over the stone. The medium enters the individual chambers through a needle. The reactor is kept at an angle of 10 degrees so that the liquid flows along the length of the stone. This crow method easily allows simulation of important environmental conditions like variation in temperature, light intensity, acid rain, variation of salinity, variation in rainfall events, and the gas in the head space can be also changed, and the reactor can be accommodated in some environmental chamber to control intensity of the light and the temperature. And in the picture, you can see the drip flow reactor to grow a cyanobacterial biofilm here. And here on uh, the bottom, you can see a homemade drip flow reactor because uh, you can uh, also um, build an unmade drip flow reactor very, very uh, easily. Um, in the last year, uh, the development of culture independent technologies has significantly increased the understanding of the microbial processes. The commonly used throughput screening methods of microbiome are amplicon and metagenomic sequencing. Metagenomic sequencing provides more information than amplicon sequencing, but 
um, they are uh, more expensive. Among these, the Illumita is a massive sequencing technology known as next generation sequencing that has completely changed the biological sciences. The most important output files from Amplicon and metagenomic analysis are taxonomic and functional tables. And analysis of this table uh, include health and beta diversity, taxonomic uh, composition, difference um, comparison, correlation analysis, natural analysis, classification, and phylogenetic tree. Uh, so it is um, it is a very um, important, uh, um, um, a very um, important technique. When um, a biodeterioration impact is proven, conservative strategies have to be considered. The conservation of cultural heritage is mainly associated with two aspects, prevention and control. Prevention methods are intended to prevent and minimize the risk of microbial deterioration by controlling environmental parameters and maintaining an optimal state of cleaning and conservation. This is possible in the indoor environment where physiochemical physio uh, parameters should be controlled to avoid a high temperature, to avoid high relative humidity, to avoid strong lightning and poor ventilation. In an outdoor environment, the control of physical chemical parameter is not possible. And the only chance to prevent a biological attack is, is through routine monitoring. On the other side, there are control strategies that eradicate microorganisms. These methods involve mechanical, physical, physical, and chemical methods. Mechanical methods consist of the traditional removal of biological material with suitable tools. They are widely used, but can lead to uh, the damage of stone. Additionally, side effects in, uh, include the production of the organic debris of dead cell, which are readily used as a carbon source by other microorganisms. Physical methods include the use of ultraviolet, gamma, or X radiation. In addition, we have thermal treatments such as microwave, heat irradiation, heat shock treatment, uh, that are very good alternative. Thanks to their low interaction with the substrate and penetration depth, they are safe for the cultural set, but also for operators and the environment. Only in the last instance is the use of chemical or stone protective treatments. Chemical treatments with biocide and coating products are currently the widest used to control microorganisms. The number of biocide currently suitable for cultural heritage is not high, but it is limited because only a small number of agents have been tested with respect to their compatibility with historic materials. Besides the compatibility with the material, one of the most challenging aspects of the biocide treatment is the fact that in many cases, objects are infested by a mixed community of microorganisms with different levels of susceptibility to work the chemical compound applied. Treatment often has brief duration and application must be repeated frequently, especially in outdoor environment. Repeated biocide, biocidal treatment exerts a, select, a selective pressure on the microbial community. And in the worst case, the community may be turned into one that is less sensitive or even resistant to the biocide. It might become even more harmful to the object. Other unwanted side effects include the potential toxicity for the operator and the risk for the environment. In addition, uh, most of chemical practices are often inefficient. The application of biocide can provide organic carbon nitrogen sources of nutrients for microorganisms inhabiting some monuments. Moreover, biofilm are known to resist chemical attack. Tolerance arise as biofilm metrics quench the activity of antimicrobial, or as a consequence of the slow grow rates that, ad that are adopted cells within the biofilm. This, this uh, slow growth rate enables tolerance toward many antimicrobial drugs. Furthermore, inhibition of diffusion reaction decreases the concentration of antimicrobial to sublethal concentration and led to the survival of exposed cells and to the development of resistance. 
And this is the case of the Cathedral of Monza in Italy uh, that was affected by dark and green subaerial bifin covering the marmol elements. The conservators tried to remove the sesamic organisms to reduce discoloration. Two nearby sculptures made of candoglia marmol were selected. One was cleaned with a combination of three biocide and mechanically, and the other was left untreated as control. The impact of the treatment was investigated after one mile from the cleaning. Despite a good aesthetic result was obtained, the cleaning treatment was, all, was only partially effective in removing the biofilm from the colonized surfaces. After the treatment, the number of viable cells drastic, drastically decreased, but complete biofilm removal was not achieved, even after repeated surface brushing and washing. As shown in the picture, at the microscope here. Additionally, a functional analysis of microorganisms predicted that the cleaning process selected microorganisms potentially more resistant to biocide. After the cleaning, prevention procedure had to be planned in order to avoid a new recolonization. This effect can be reached by the application of coating products that generally combine, among other consolidants, either repellents and surfactants. However, the ability of microorganisms to attack a wide range of polymeric sub substances, including those added to some for protective reason, and especially if aged, has to be considering, considered during conservation treatment. During the last decade, the most satisfactory commercial acrylic resin was Paraloid B72. Um, Paraloid B72 um, has a good water repellent and um, has uh, uh, an optically clear appearance. In one of my published work, we demonstrated that the occurrence of photochemical degradation reaction of the polymer promoted fertile condition for fungi proliferation. Three protective polymers, aged or artificially aged, were inoculated, uh, were inoculated with a mix of five fungi sprayed onto the surface according to a standard procedure. Resistance of each polymer to fungal lacta was monitored by measuring the percentage of the surface covered by fungi after 28 days from sporing incubation. At the end of the experiment, both unaged and artificially aged polymers show a percentage of area covered by fungi. Furthermore, aged polymers were more prone to be colonized by fungi with respect to the corresponding unaged one. In the picture, I show the microscope images of fungi standing with a probe specific for fungi and grow onto the three tested polymer in an aged and aged condition. It is possible to clearly see a myofurga present in aged polymers in comparison to an aged one. More fungi, less fungi in an aged one. A case of study uh, regarding this topic is the Cathedral of Milan. In this case, Capitelli and colleagues demonstrated the occurrence of meristematic fungi on many marble samples treated with acrylic resin. The Milan Cathedral presented an extensive blackening. The pigmentation was due by the presence of meristematic fungi that accumulate melanin in the cell wall. They grow between stone crystals cause the physical disruption of the structural component of the crystals, resulting in biopitting and formation of cracks and fissures. Fungi were present exactly in the area previously consolidated or protected with the synthetic products. Especially the Milan Cathedral Stone Sample reveal an extended fungi colonization when synthetic resin were deteriorated in comparison to the aged but not deteriorated sample. However, biofilm had been recognized responsible of aesthetic and physiochemical deterioration of stone. In consequence, their removal from cultural heritage on surface is widely, considered, is widely considered the necessary step in cultural heritage conservation. However, detecting microorganisms does not automatically imply an, involvem, an involvement in the biodecay process of the lithic substrate. It is now clear that in certain conditions, biofilm may have a bioprotective effect and even consider a potential biotechnological solution for conservation. 
Complex microbial communities protect the substrato from rapid decomposition by formation of tight network of cells and extracellular polymers, which surround the mineral particles. And rapid decrease in biogenic matrix temporarily stabilize the surface and reduce weathering. And lithic microorganisms can limit erosion by reducing the level of water within the rock and also protect the surface from wind erosion and reduce thermoclastic damaging due to the intermet um, due to um, um, the, the changes in the solar radiation. Cyanobacteria significantly modify macroclimate at the sun surface with a reduction of thermal maxima and damping of short-term fluctuation in temperature and relative humidity. The lichens act like an umbrella and protect the underlying substrate from the mechanical effect of rain and drop impacts, acid attack, airborne pollutants, and salt deposition, and reflect solar radiation. However, it is not clear why some communities are deteriorative and others are protective, or why they can be deteriorative under some environmental condition and bioprotective under others. This bioprotection effect depends upon the metabolic activity of the microorganism and is subjected to seasonal variation. It seems that areas which experience an increased frequency of climate fluctuation are more prone to experience a shift from bioprotective to biodeteriorative condition and the contrary, and vice versa. Uh, for example, the monastery of San Martino Pinario is located in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. Uh, the upper zone of the background wall of the, um, of the processional cloister is affected by a deep green, highly hydrophobic subaidal piping. In this research, the bioprotective or biodeteriorative role of the biofilm on the cloister was studied. The findings show that Apatococcus lobatus was the predominant cyanobacteria in the biofilm. Biofilm sample was found extremely repellent to the water, with a water drop penetration time of more than one hour, and a wide water contact angles. The contact angle could not be measured on the not colonized zone, as the drop was absorbed immediately upon falling. In this monastery, biofilm acts as a natural waterproofing agent on the building, preventing the entry of water into the zone and the salt crystal formation. And it is a major cause um, would, um, prevent um, um, the entry of water into the zone and salt crystal formation that are a major cause of zone deterioration. Finally, biofilm can even consider a potential biotechnological solution for conservation, thanks to their enzymatic and metabolic activities. Intervention with microorganisms have been proven to be useful in restoration of artwork, especially when classical chemical and mechanical methods fail or produce poor or short-term effects. Microorganisms can be isolated from environment matrices, screening, and selective for the ability to remove deposit of an undesirable organic and inorganic substance that is called bioclinic activity, or for their capabilities to consolidate stone works and monuments. This is called bioconsolidation. Uh, Biocleaning with different viable bacteria culture has been used for the removal of sulfate and nitrate crust as well as organic matter. Microorganisms exploit their naturally occurring metabolic processes by transforming the surface layer component into no toxic cases dispersed into the atmosphere, such as nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen sulfate. Very recently, I published a pioneering work about the possibility to use bacteria and biofilm to remove graffiti paint spray from the stone building also. Among several examples reported in the literature, I would like to show you the result of some work performed my by my research colleagues. The first is related to the biocleaning of a marble sculpture of the Cathedral of Milan. 
The aim of this research was to compare the efficacy of traditional chemical cleaning procedure with the efficacy of biological methods for in situ removal of black layer on the marmot sculpture. Black crust represents an aesthetic image of stone work produced by the combination of gypsum deposit of stone and particles from hair pollution. The marmot relief surface was divided into two areas. One was treated with an ammonium carbonate EDTA mixture, and the other with the sulfate reducing bacterium, the sulfur vibro vulgaris. The chemically and biological treated areas underwent two 24 hours application for a total duration of 48 hours for both treatments, which were performed at the same time to ensure the same treatment condition. In contrast to the chemical cleaning method, the biological procedure resulting in more homogeneous removal here of the surface deposit and preserving the patina noble under the blood crust. So this is the no treatment, this is the chemical treatment, and this is the biological treatment. And this is the starting condition. Another case of study, uh, another work of biocleaning um, um, was the biological treatment on the marble base of the Pietaro Danini by Michelangelo. Uh, this base um, of the sculpture was altered by gray black deposit, chemically characterized calcite and gypsum. Here, you can see. Uh, the sulfate reducing bacterium, the sulfur vibro vulgaris, was used in this study. Cells were resuspended in a buffer and a carbogel powder was added to the suspension to produce a delivery system with immobilized cells. The activated gel was applied on the altered surface. After 24 hours, gel was removed. Once the bacteria were removed, gray black deposits were not anymore present and also the calcite was easily taken out. This is after the biological treatment and before the biological treatment. And again, this is the case of two sculptures uh, in the courtyard of the Buon Consiglio Castle in Trento, in Italy. A first inspection revealed the presence of black crust and the highlighted the microbial contamination causing discoloration. Again, the sulfur vibro vulgaris was used as a biocleaning agent, and the delivery system was carbogel. The biologically treated areas underwent three 12 hours application for a total of uh, 36 hours. The biological cleaning system was covered with a pl plastic film to reduce undesirable evaporation. The treatment with this sulfate reducing bacteria was effective in the removal of black crust, as you can see in the picture. So this is before the black, after 12 hours, partial cleaning, and after 36 hours, complete cleaning. Finally, bacteria can also be used for the consolidation rock by enhancing calcium carbonate precipitation through passive and active processes. In the past, carbonatogenesis bacteria activity induced chemical changes in the macro environment, leading to the accumulation of carbonate and bicarbonate and to the precipitation of solid particles. In active precipitation, the carbonate particles are produced by ionic exchanges through the bacterial cell membrane. Um, in conclusion, microorganisms uh, do not always cause chemical or physical modification to some cultural heritage. Sometimes it is only a stone discoloration, which implies only a change to the heritage surface color. Sometimes the growth biofilm can lead to the formation of a protective layer with advantage of being more compatible with the preservation of heritage surfaces in comparison to traditional protective coating. Therefore, control strategies are not always the solution. And an accurate investigation of the site to clearly understand if we are dealing with a biodeterioration, an aesthetic alteration, or a bioprotection is a must in the cultural heritage conservation science. So I'm finished and I would like to thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And a special thank to my colleagues, Professor Francesca Capitelli and Professor Federica Villa. 
Um, another postdoc um, working in my lab, Federica Troiano, Maurizio, who is the Howard technician, and Fabio Furlani, um, he is the, the biochemist working with us. Thanks, Christina. Great stuff. Wow, that's really fascinating. Um, something we don't get to hear about too often as well, so it's a real treat. Um, I've got some questions in here in the chat for you. If I could just maybe start throwing some at you here. We've got a, a, maybe we, if people don't mind staying a little bit over, um, we'll try to get as many answered as we can. So the first question actually relates to the concept of bioreceptivity that you talked about. Yes. I, I think you kind of addressed this at the end of your talk, but just to confirm, so the concept of bioreceptivity um, means that the colonization of the rock will not necessarily damage the rock? It, yes. That in some yes. cases it can add or aid in its preservation. Is that correct? Could you just confirm yes. that? Yes, okay. it is correct. And it is yeah. also, um, we have um, just, I have a slide I show you, just, just a moment. Uh, because it, it was too much long and so I have to cut a lot. <laughs> um, no, uh, I'm not. Uh, sorry. That's okay. uh, yes, yes. Um, bioreceptivity is not correlated to, to biodeterioration. Ah, uh, okay. I think that's what the it's question the, was. It's the opposite. Yeah. It's just the ability of microorganisms to colonize one type of one type of stone in, com in comparison to other type of storm. Uh -huh. For example, sandstorm are colonized uh, uh, more in comparison to marble stone, for example, um, because they are different at a chemical point of view, but also the texture, uh, yeah. the porosity. Uh, this, is, uh, this is very important. Uh, yes, bioreceptivity is not correlated to biodeterioration. Uh, we have a question from Rosa Santo Martino uh, about the UK's darkened buildings, which I think many of us probably would agree with her. Th we thought was a result of pollution and smog mainly, but do you think that a significant amount of that darkening could be contributed by microbial uh, deterioration? Sorry, can you repeat, please? Yeah, yeah. So the UK has lots of buildings that are darkened, essentially have darkened stains, and, mm -hmm. and I think many people think it's pollution, air pollution, a, a smog. Um, but could it actually be due to microbial deterioration? Uh, hey, yes. No, um, it depends. You have to analyze them because um, can be the, can be black crust. It is the combination of gypsum with hair pollution, or maybe it can be absolutely the blackening of meristematic fungi. But that's the reason that you have to investigate uh, one building, one site, because uh, before uh, uh, a conservation strategy, because it, 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 um, you have to analyze. It is not possible to um, generalize. Generalize, but also. Yeah. Um, if, 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 I, if I see a stone, it is not possible uh, to oh. say, okay, it, it is meristematic fungi, or it is the hair pollution, or it is just black crust, uh, you yeah. have to analyze. And the first analysis that we do uh, always is just microscopic analysis, because uh, with microscopic analysis, you can uh, um, see very uh, easily and in a very, very fast way if uh, there is bacteria or fungi or not. So, so when a company or just someone asks to our lab to do um, a study uh, before a conservative treatment, the first thing that we do is just to have a picture at the microscope to look inside the microscope at the sample. This is the first one. So it is not possible to say, okay, it's meristematic fungi, it is hair pollution, it is uh, uh, black crust. Right. Along that line uh, about analysis, can I ask you, actually, I had a question about when you sample these different stone types, do you think there's any possible effect of the stone um, on the sampling efficiency? Like does, does one type of stone lend better to sampling for metagenomics or for microscopy work than mm, another? Or how no, do you- No, the type of stone, no, no, okay. no, no, no. Uh, 
because when uh, so when you would like to do uh, a molecular uh, investigation, you just scrap the biofilm, but you have to scrap the, exactly the same amount of biofilm on the different type of rocks. Eh? Um, uh, no, no, there is no difference about the stone at this point of view. No, 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 no. It is there is no um, changes in um, in the sampling procedure about the type of stone. Yes, there are some stone that are soft and the other they are uh -huh. hard. Yeah. But okay. um, so, for example, when we do analysis by microscope, uh, we use the adhesive tape. Adhesive tape is efficient on every kind of stone. Mm. So um, it, it, no, uh, so, I think there is no difference. Okay. Um, did I understand you correctly that you said the biocides sometimes provide nutrients? Or oh lower... yes, that's the big problem. <laughs> and it, it is the modern <laughs> view of the cultural heritage. Until some years ago, a uh, conservator just put on cultural heritage, biocide, biocide, and tons of biocide. <laughs> and that's the big problem because we have in Italy, but I think all over the world, a lot of monuments completely covered with biocide, consolidant, and bacteria and fungi eat these biocide and eat these uh, consolidants and eat these, uh, uh, these chemical compounds. So this is not the good, the good idea. Oh, that's fascinating. So the, the contemporary point of view is that sometimes it's better doing nothing because mm -hmm. that's the better strategy. Uh, if there is not uh, a stone, uh, if the deterioration of the stone is not so high, the, the best strategy is doing nothing. At the moment, <laughs> this is the contemporary point of view of the research in the cultural heritage conservation. Wow. So we have a question about archaea, actually. Is there, can you comment on, on the role of archaea? Did you investigate them? Or do they have a role in these? Uh, this is, a, this is an, another new field of the research. No, I did not investigate, but um, we are starting to do in the lab this. Uh, but archaea are very difficult to investigate or mm. set a molecular point of view. Um, this is, uh, this is the research of the future <laughs> in our lab. <laughs> yes. Um, just one question about bioreceptivities, a question in the, in the, in the chat here about um, in order for the, the, the biofilm not to damage the stone, um, does it always need to be removed after the treatment? Or, and kind of a, a follow-up question, what about the, the, the evidence that you showed for like penetration of the stone? You, can you sample that? colony or those colonies that have actually gone into the cracks and things like that? Uh, How do you know what they are? Yes, you can do the, the, the section of the stone and uh, yeah. can analyze. So I show you in, in, um, in one of my first here, for example, um, just a moment. I think another fascinating thing that you told us was that some of yeah, the uh, example, protectants. It is a cross section. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. yes, yes. So yeah. you can cut very, very thin the stone, mm -hmm. and you can see uh, the microbial penetration inside the stone. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, and here you can see cyanobacteria on the top, and then heterotrophic microorganism on uh, on the bottom. In, in the lower uh, uh, position of the stone. You mentioned something about the bioprotectants degrading due to light and potentially providing substrates. Is that also true for some of the polymers that you looked at, the fungal penetration of the polymer? Can these polymers degrade and provide substrates as well? Yes, of course. Yes, and they attack polymer are are attacked by microorganisms very, very fast. So what's the purpose of these polymers? Is it actually a protectant or? Um, so if the polymer can be protective, no, oh. uh, I, don't, mm, I don't understand, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. What is the purpose of Paraloid B72? Yes, what? it is, no, it is a, it is a protective, uh, oh, okay. uh, yes, a protective um, polymers. Hmm that it is widely used, was widely used in the, in the past, 
but now with the light degrade and when uh, is degraded is um, uh, attacked attacked by microorganism. Wow. So they, they use as a um, they use as a nutrient, and you can see here. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is just um, just some letter, but this is the paraloy B twenty two and mm -hmm. other type of polymers, and you can see the unaged and the aged one is full of fungi. Fungi are this line in blue, uh, full, and uh, this is a very very problem in this case. Oh, that's so amazing. This research, the, the, the goal of this research is to provide new protective uh, um, um, for, for the zone, because sometimes it is necessary to provide protection and coating. And so this research was a collaboration with a chemical group of our lab to, to develop new protective uh, polymers. Great. Does anyone have a final question for Christina? Yes. I, I realize we've gone over the hour a little bit, but I, I probably started us off a bit late um, talking in your introduction a bit. So, um, oh, here's a, there's a comment in the chat about um, a paper published on the effects of biocides and came to the same conclusion, right? Yeah. There's, a, there's some interesting stuff published recently on um, urban microbiome as well that I, I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, Separately, I'll send you a paper um, that has looked at the, the uh, different types of materials and their microbiomes, trying to get a sense of whether different types of building materials, wood or stone, or in a city, have different types of microbial communities. Um, I, it's a paper that just recently came out, but I'll, I'll send it to you separately. I'd be curious to get your thoughts about that. Um, well, okay, if, that's, if no one else has any final questions, then I think maybe we'll conclude for today and just thank our speaker once again for a, an excellent, fascinating talk. Thank you very much for joining us today, Christina, and thanks to everyone. Just a, a heads up that in two weeks, we'll have the final talk of our 2020-2021 academic year series. Uh, Professor Terry McGannady from Uni uh, Essex will be talking to us about limits to microbial life. Slow, salty, subterranean survival. Sounds interesting. So please do join us again in a couple of weeks if you can. And um, thanks to everyone and keep well. Uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>